What's up, guys, and welcome back to the One Take Podcast. Once again, I've got Jeremy here with me. Say hello, Jeremy. Hello. And I'm Gil. Today, we're talking about The Mandalorian, Episode 3. We'll do a full recap and review. This episode was titled The Sin. And uh, just at a high level, Jeremy, what were your thoughts on this episode? Are you still liking the show as much as you did with Episodes 1 and 2? Definitely still liking the show. I think whereas part of our episode two reaction was, uh, you know, you used the phrase side quest Mm -hmm. a couple times. It felt like kind of a very interesting, but still a one-off. I think this was kind of back the other way. We're getting more bigger picture information, bigger things that feel like they're season-long arc uh, implications. And uh, yeah, no, I I really liked it. Good action, good, good fun, you know, Star Wars, the universe's giant stuff. And yeah, enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, same here. I feel like we learned a little bit more about the Mandalorian culture. It also felt like the first three episodes were almost the setup for the overarching plot. Get Baby Yoda, get out of town, and now the whole world's after him. It feels like we just got to the end of that setup, and curious to see where we go with episode four. But yeah, overall, really enjoying the show, loving the Western vibe you know, by way of the Star Wars universe. But with that, let's get right into the episode. So we start off where we left off at the end of episode two with the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda in the Mandalorian's ship. Uh, Mando gets a message from Grief Karga, that's uh, Carl Weathers' character, basically telling him to bring the asset Baby Yoda directly back to Werner Herzog's character, who is mysteriously credited as just the client. And Baby Yoda also gets out of his pod for a second and grabs a little, what would you call it, like a knob? Yeah, I guess like a knob, yeah. Like on like a gear shifty looking Yeah, that's thing. what I called yeah. it. It looked like the ship's gear shift. He yeah. took the ball off it and started kind of playing with it. Then Mando gets back to uh, back on planet. He walks through town with Baby Yoda floating next to him, gets back to uh, Werner Herzog, the stormtroopers treat treat Baby Yoda a little roughly. They kind of grab his uh, pod. Mando tells him, easy with that. And then the stormtrooper has a great comeback. You take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> we also, by the way, I think it's right there, or maybe it's after when he walks out, but there are more of the uh, like spit-roasted, uh, salacious crumb <laughs> people, which they just they love it. And there was also that man with the giant, like he looks like a... Uh, Toad from from Super Mario with his like big giant hat <laughs> thing. I noticed some of the same uh, you know folks wandering around town mm-hmm. in that little sequence, which was interesting. Like you can tell that everyone's like kind of looking, eyeing him uh, as he as he comes back. Yeah, and I thought when he was walking through town, it seemed like he had no qualms about having Baby Yoda just floating next to him. Yeah, didn't even have the pod closed; it was open. I kind of felt like from uh, Baby Yoda's expression, he was sort of like, oh my, what are we doing here? This is uh, nerve wracking. Yeah, very, very reckless. Yeah. yeah. But I guess, I guess on second thought, uh, people probably don't, what this helps establish is it seems like people don't really know about the, the Yoda species. Like nobody's looking at Baby Yoda and going like, oh my God, it's another, it's a baby version of Yoda. Right. Yeah. And I guess their uh, things that they use later had not been reactivated yet so there was no uh you know no reason for every person to be side-eyeing as they as they walk through yeah there. yeah i was wondering about the the logistics of how those fobs work because later in the episode when mando goes and frees baby yoda all the fobs go off and alert right. the bounty hunters yeah another interesting thing with that is that he like the when he gives him that job when when grief Carga gives him that job he's like at first hesitant like it's not the first thing he says mm-hmm. but i was like well there is this one extra <laughs> job and now we find out in this episode every single person seemingly in the world was, yeah. on, was also on this job <laughs> he buried the lead that should have been the first job that was reverse psychology yeah he's had that same conversation 50 times well there is this one i don't know if i should tell you this there is this one right. job i wouldn't tell us <laughs> to just anybody but <laughs> meanwhile he's giving it to everyone yeah <laughs> So Mando is talking to Werner Herzog's character, the client. Uh, the client and his doctor, it's un- unclear the power dynamic there still. Is the doctor working for Werner Herzog? Are they kind of working together? But the doctor scans the baby Yoda and says he's very healthy. 
And then uh, Werner Herzog and Mando have a conversation where it comes out that, yes, they've given out many of these fobs, so many people are after the Baby Yoda. Mando gets a bunch of Beskar, and as Mando's leaving, before he leaves, he turns and he asks, what are your plans for it? And then, as always, got to do this in the Werner Herzog voice. How uncharacteristic of one of your reputation. You have taken both commission and payment. Is it not the code of the guild that these events are now forgotten? And as he says that, some stormtroopers kind of walk in menacingly. Also in this conversation, Werner Herzog says that finding a Mandalorian in these trying times is more difficult than finding the steel, the Beskar steel. So I think there's a few times this episode where they try to underline how kind of rare it is to see Mandalorians. And I don't know about you, for me, that felt like kind of a new idea. I don't know if we were already supposed to have that impression from the first couple of episodes. Yeah, I certainly don't think I would have gathered it from just the first couple of episodes. I mean, I think in general, in like Star Wars lore, they're they're kind of like a, uh, you know, a more secretive uh, society, Mm -hmm. a more rare person to, to run into. They're area is uh underground even though it has a huge giant mandalorian symbol over the top of the entrance (laughs) is that right it's like the least well hidden uh i don't know but yeah no they definitely i guess in in spite of being seemingly not very far from uh uh, upwards of 20 or 30 of them Mm -hmm. uh that they're they're hard to come by yeah well so from there uh, the Mando goes back to the hideout we were just talking about and uh, meets up again with the armorer or the spiky helmet lady Mandalorian. And she sees that his armor is all damaged. The Mandalorian makes a comment about how he may need to begin again. So it seems like they've been emphasizing as part of the Mandalorian culture is almost this video game-esque, just constant upgrading of your armor and your equipment. Uh, which I thought was interesting. And with all the steel he brings back, she tells him that she can build him a full cuirass. You know what a cuirass is? I mean, uh, not beyond <laughs> that it's like a chest plate, which again is mostly something I know from video game mm-hmm. type stuff. Yeah. I but it's not guess. just a chest plate. It's also a back plate. Oh, Laced okay. together. All right. Front and back. So it's a big upgrade for him. But she warns him that it'll draw a lot of attention. And as they're talking, a bunch of other Mandalorians kind of creep in in the background. Especially this one guy, this kind of bigger Mandalorian. (laughs) What are you laughing at? I mean, it was very quick. Like, everything in this show moves very quick. But she's like, be careful. This might get you some attention. And then five guys immediately walk in right after she... (laughs) So to be a, to to give a more charitable read, I think what got him all the attention was just the fact that he was walking in with so much uh, best car steel definitely, to begin definitely. with. Definitely, yes. And then this heavy infantry uh, Mandalorian, this kind of big Mandalorian, he he scoffs and looks at all that steel and says, "These were cast in an imperial smelter. These are the spoils of the Great Purge." It's basically telling him this is all blood money, right? And uh, then he comments, we live in the shadows and only come above ground one at a time. So again, the episode really wants us to know it is rare for Mandalorians to leave this underground hideout. And uh, it's a uh, subtle foreshadowing. A lot of, yeah, there's a lot of that too. Because like, the same, in, I mean, you'll get to it in like 30 seconds, but mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, foreshadowing. So yeah. Uh, Mandalorian and the heavy infantry Mandalorian get into a big uh, kind of fist fight. They eventually draw blades. And then the armorer steps in to break up the fight. She talks about how the Empire has fallen. So it's only right, basically, that we take all this steel back. And she makes reference to the way of the Mandalorian. And then says, this is the way, right? And everybody else kind of repeats that. Uh, Also, in the midst of this conversation, the armorer asks the Mandalorian... Have you ever removed your helmet? He says, no. And she asks, has it ever been removed by others? He says, never. And then she says, this is the way. The whole group of Mandalorians say, this is the way. And the fight is broken up. Now, question on that point about the helmets. Did you take that literally, as in even in private, that helmet never comes off your head? I think I did, yeah. I 
I guess I didn't really consider it, but I, w- I would assume, yeah, they just don't take it off. So how do they bathe, eat, any other things that would require access to your mouth? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess they must they must take it at least partially off to yeah. eat. I'm thinking of Watchmen now with like a... Right, <laughs> the Rorschach your, or looking uh, glass, yeah. roll it up above your... your uh, can of beans uh, with right. a spoon. Or that little T window in the helmet can just slide open. Just very specifically straw sized there. food. Oh, yeah, or a straw, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All, we only eat T-shaped foods. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I was intrigued by that, so I did do a little bit of research, and I know that in Star Wars Rebels, which is canon, takes place between uh, Revenge of the Sith, right, and A New Hope, mm-hmm. and in that show, there are Mandalorians who take their helmets off, but this show takes place five years after Return of the Jedi, so it's years later, it seems like something called the Great Purge happened somewhere in between Star Wars Rebels and the Mandalorian. So maybe they used to take their helmets off, but now because they're trying to be so secretive and so protective, their culture maybe has evolved now, so they literally never take it off. But that's how I interpreted it, and uh, I don't know, I'm curious to see if we learn a little bit more about that aspect of their culture. I mean, if it's, if it's like everything else in this series, when they reference a plot point, that poses a question, they will return to it and, and answer that question. Yeah, usually immediately. So but. if an episode opens with, there's only one circumstance under which you will ever remove your helmet. Right. It's fast forward 10 minutes. Right. Yes, you will then see it. Yeah. Uh, so she asks the Mandalorian how his armor got damaged. He explains it was a mudhorn, that big monster that he fought in the last episode. But he explains it was not a noble kill. He was helped by an enemy. The armorer asks, why did the enemy help you? And the Mandalorian says, it did not know it was my enemy. So he's he's basically calling Baby Yoda his enemy, which is heartbreaking to hear that, I thought. Yeah, I mean, he was the target. This is a man of, uh, he plays by the Mandalorian book. Right, until the next scene. Until the next scene. (laughs) Uh, So she says, all right, so we can't make that your signet. So instead of that, I'm going to make you some whistling birds. And she explains that this is a weapon which is good against multiple simultaneous enemies, but use them sparingly. They're very rare. And in my notes here, I wrote Chekhov's Whistling Birds. It's like Chekhov's gun. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yes. You don't show the gun without, without using it. And, uh, right. Yeah. I, yeah. I would have thought maybe like a, a much later reveal giving us some time to forget about the Whistling Birds or, you know. But still, good. Cool whistling. Bird. At first, I thought she meant that's what the signet was going to oh, be. Oh yeah, and I didn't. I was that. That seems very interesting. Yeah, it felt weird to me that it was either a signet or whistling birds because I think she still made him the curious. So I figured the signet would just be kind of chiseled into it. Right. Yeah. So how is it one or the other? I don't know. One of the many mysteries that will be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back. Episode seven. Remember those whistling birds we made for you? Yeah. The signet, do you think the signet's going to be the final reveal of everything? Oh, that's a great prediction. Final shot of the final season. Final shot is the signet going on? Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go with yeah. I think that's going to be the final shot. And the signet will be Baby Yoda? I'm not sure. I guess that would imply he kills Baby Yoda. That would be a twist. Oh wow. This could be a real bummer of a of a season finale. <laughs> Uh, while uh, the armorer is uh, iron smithing his new armor, once again, every time she kind of smashes the armor with her hammer, we get more flashbacks to the Mandalorian as a child. So we see glimpses of what I assume is the Great Purge. Uh, we see, so one thing you were asking about last time we spoke is why is he so biased against droids? And it looks like these big droids played a role in uh, terrorizing this community, basically. Definitely. At one point, um, I guess uh, probably the Mandalorian's mother, this this woman, throws him into a little kind of hideout. Immediately afterwards, the hideout gets ripped open. You see a droid there. And then that's the end of the flashback. So I assume this isn't the last time we're going to see this flashback. I assume we're going to see more of this. And I've got to assume that someone saved him at the last second there, right? Because that droid looked like it was about to blast him. Any theories on who may have rescued him? 
well, I mean, I, I feel like I'm supposed to guess Boba Fett, right? That seems like a... Uh, oh, it would some not other... have occurred to me. Oh, I don't know. I, mean, I don't even know if that timeline would, would, would make sense, but uh, I, maybe the... Maybe the armor, and then that's... Uh, Maybe. I don't know. That was one of... So at first, I thought... I basically cycled through every character we've seen on the show. Right. And there's really nobody that he has, like, an adopted father or mother kind of relationship with besides maybe the armorer. So, and even that is... I, wouldn't, I would not have characterized it that way. Right. Except for the fact that I'm looking for it. Uh, one theory I had is nobody in the Great Purge sequence, none of them were wearing armor or helmets or anything. Is it possible that he was adopted into the Mandalorian culture? Mm. Maybe he's rescued by the armorer or another Mandalorian, throw a helmet on him and kind of train him in their ways. Yeah, that could be. Or what if he's not the child in the flashback? What if he is about to walk in? Oh, as he rescues the, the child. He rescues the child. I don't know oh, that yeah. who the child would be, but yeah, you know, could be that could be the old, the old bait and switch there with the who's who in the flashback. Right. Who is the Mandalorian? We all assume it's the guy we've been watching. Maybe it's somebody else. Wow. <laughs> Maybe. Ooh. Oh, theory on the spot. Okay. What would be cuter than Baby Yoda wearing a little Mandalorian helmet? Oh, Baby Yoda is the Mandalorian. Baby Yoda is the Mandalorian. Maybe. <laughs> wow. That would be very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy force wielding Mandalorian. Like the Mandalorians don't have the force. Right. And they are already of lethal feared mercenary type. Yeah, I think they're one of the few that can kind of go toe to toe go toe to toe with a Jedi that don't have force abilities themselves. So all right, we'll powerful. see. I think that's a that's a one take original theory. Yeah, it's gonna be a anywhere. bummer when uh, at the end of Rise of Skywalker, like it looks like Ray's about to die, <laughs> and then Baby Yoda comes out in a tiny Mandalorian helmet <laughs> and saves the day. Baby Yoda is the Captain Marvel. Yeah, of, uh, yeah. of Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> yeah, just flies out of the sky, saves the whole day. Yeah. <laughs> So from there, the Mandalorian goes to see Grief Karga, Carl Weathers' character. As he walks into the bar, everybody's looking at him. And Grief Karga explains that they all hate you, Mando. You're a legend. Because he's the one guy who's able to do the job they all failed at. He asks, uh, how can I show my gratitude to my most valuable partner? Because Grief Karga made a bunch of money off this too. Uh, Mandalorian, badass that he is, says, I want my next job. And uh, Grief Karga says, hey, man, take a break. Why don't we go to the Twi'lek healing baths? You know who the Twi'lek are? I do. All right, why don't you... Uh, they have the big... Uh, I mean, I, you might have a more apt description uh, than I do if it's, if it's written down, but they are kind of the, like... I, th- I feel like the signature thing you think of is in is in Jabba's palace. They're they're one of the like chained up uh, dancer mm-hmm. creatures. They have these big, long uh, kind of tentacles i guess that come out of their head i don't know if they're called tentacles but they come out of their head uh they're they're like a green or blue yep yeah yeah that was basically word for word what i had written in my notes yeah yeah, i rambled a little bit more i'm sure but yeah no and um fun fact about the twi'lek uh when i was a kid and i would watch return of the jedi i would have to fast forward through any scene that they were in because i found those tentacle things Mm. gross and then as a child i couldn't watch that scene it's a tough. There's a lot of tough stuff going on in all those scenes, in all the Jabba's palace yeah. scenes. So, like those little, what were they called again? The, the little creatures that were on the spigot. Oh uh, well, Salacious Crumb is that particular one. I don't remember the name of the species. Oh, often, so, okay. But that that screaming, screeching one was Salacious Pea Crumb. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, he gives him his next job. He takes uh, uh, one of the what do they call those pucks? Pucks. Takes a puck that points him to uh, a guy who's going to be in the ocean dunes of Karnak, very far away, a nobleman's son who skipped bail, and he is of the same species as, uh, it's a trap! Yeah, Admiral Akbar. yeah, Mon Calamari, uh, nobleman's son, right. skipped bail. Maybe yeah. the nobleman, I mean, it's in now, but maybe the, you know. I don't <laughs> is, um, Callum, what's his name again? Admiral Akbar. Yeah, Admiral Akbar. is he a nobleman? Uh, I mean, he's a he's a storied war hero, so okay. I'm sure I would think so. All right, so I don't know. I don't know what qualifies you as a nobleman or not. Or is it just like you're a person of stature, or yeah, I mean, he's a hero. So he's a, I feel like they would have said a war hero's son, 
or oh maybe he's he's enjoying the spoils post war and now he's a nobleman yeah could be uh, so he takes the job, and once again, he's concerned about Baby Yoda. So before he leaves, he asks Grief Karga, any idea what they're going to do with it, the kid? And Grief says, I didn't ask. It's against the guild code. Mando says they work for the Empire. He's worried about what they're going to do to him. And Grief says the Empire's gone. All they have left now are mercenaries and warlords. Basically tells him, if you've got a problem with it, go report it to the New Republic. And the Mandalorian says, that's a joke. Uh, the New Republic, that's basically the government that took over after the rebellion knocked out the Empire. But sounds like, at least to these people, they don't see them as really having that much power. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I feel like that's always the case in any government, but it's specifically right. in the when you're in like the bar in this kind of you know seedy cantina area right the government's useless yeah he's not going to place an anonymous call to the police and be like right. hey i've got a tip for you it's a right. baby yoda out there right. what it's a baby yoda <laughs> right I'll, i murdered uh, about 500 people <laughs> to get this tiny baby and i turned him over to a creepy doctor and a cloaked man and I killed people there too. And uh, anyway, you should probably look into it. Yeah. <laughs> Click. You know. So he gets on his ship. He's about to leave. But then he sees that little ball, that little knob that baby Yoda was playing with. And uh, this is, it's, it's interesting because uh, I see you you're laughing over yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, it's a funny, it's a funny, it was a well done, you know, moment. Yeah. The, um, uh, it's funny how the show, it has to work around the fact, again, that you can't see pedro pascal's face so the music and the camera kind of do a lot of the work here he picks up the little ball stares at it you have a slow zoom into his helmet the music kind of communicates to us what he's feeling but you know what he's feeling i mean i'll say one thing as this episode was going i felt kind of sick to my stomach just like he he abandoned the baby i knew he was going to go back but still just seeing baby yoda get dragged away by stormtroopers and it turns your stomach a little bit certainly does yeah because you're I, I mean you said it you know he's not gonna actually leave him but the whole time you're like well when he's not gonna he's not gonna just give him to him now right, right? he's gonna go i still like those odds and and shoot and blast all of them or, or something like that yeah, and the episode is titled the sin so uh, it's almost like the red herring of is he gonna leave baby yoda and this is the sin that will eat away at him for the rest of the series that would have been uh, extremely dark. The show's already pretty dark. That yeah. would have been extremely dark. <laughs> so he goes back to uh, Werner Herzog's place, the client, and he sees Baby Yoda's pod in a dumpster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking it's at my It's not no- funny, but it's just, it's very dark. It's, just, <laughs> it's, it's so dark. And so he goes kind of from a distance, takes out his rifle, and this rifle has a pretty cool feature where he can zoom into the building. He can sort of see through walls with a, almost like what the Predator sees, the, the heat yeah, signature yeah. type of thing. But not only that, he can also hear what Werner Herzog and the doctor are saying to each other. Werner Herzog says, I order you to extract the necessary material and be done with it. Dr. Pershing says he has explicitly ordered us to bring it back alive. So again, the power dynamic here, not totally clear between the Doctor and Werner Herzog. And who is he that they're talking about? It's a great question. He, I mean, is, you know, do we think it's like a Palpatine, whoever's in charge for them? Is it like mm-hmm. a Palpatine type person? Mm-hmm. Uh, is it, it, you know, is was Baby Yoda a Yoda clone that mm-hmm. they are trying to figure out what the deal is with and... You know, there's less force users in the world now than there were previously. Maybe they're trying to harness. There's there's so many different uh, possibilities right. that there could be. Was he a clone that escaped, and they and that's why he was hiding in that base, and they needed to get him back? Mm. Like, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good stuff, a lot of answers that could be out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the the other question here that you're just alluding to is what material are they trying to extract? And the first place my mind went was midichlorians. Right. Because we saw him use the force. But it's not an in-show reason for why I don't think it's that, but just a, a meta reason of, I feel like, the fan backlash if they brought midichlorians back as a crucial plot point. 
just wouldn't go over very well. Right. I think there's a way to do it where it'd like have the same implication without actually saying midichlorian, you know, the blood of a force user, or mm. there's probably some other way to be able to do it. Or maybe, uh, you know, their their hair is really rare or something. It <laughs> fetches a good price on the, you know, right. Rashida black market or something <laughs> like that. Is that an actual Star Wars term or was that? That's a, that's a place. I don't know if they're, I assume they have a black market. It's like a seedy place. Gotcha, gotcha. A lot of seedy places in Star Wars. There are. And that's the show I feel like is, uh, is showing us the underbelly. Yeah. That we don't, we only normally get to get glimpses of it in the Star Wars universe. Uh, yeah, I meant to call out, too, in the last... I might have said it, too, but in episode one, I believe the first time we've seen a toilet in the Star Wars Oh, universe. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're really showing us all the details that you don't have time for in, uh, in A Rise right. of Skywalker. Yeah, I mean, I guess we've seen, like, a trash compactor, which was True. Well, likely some of that was, you know, was waste. sewage and waste. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, no, I think that's true. Yeah. Um. And from there, so he, he's spying on them and decides this is time for him to make his move. Mandalorian blows up a wall. And uh, you, you mentioned earlier the show gets kind of dark sometimes. So he stabs people. This part was aw- This was the best. This one might have been my favorite sequence in the whole series thus yeah. far. Other than that I love the you know cantina and different aliens and all that stuff. This sequence was awesome. What were your highlights? Uh, when he, like grappling hooks the guy and then yeah. stabs him i mean that was all i had a uh, a buddy from work that was also watching it describe it as like he went john wick and, it, and mm-hmm. i thought that was a very that you know he just it was awesome this is a we've seen him combat we've seen him you know vaporize some of the or disintegrate or whatever some of the jawas uh this was a like yet another kind of phase of his abilities that we've seen like uh, uh, hand to hand but he's kind of in stealth attack mode mm-hmm. uh just really awesome yeah definitely i think the best action sequence we've gotten in the series so far and he is brutal at one point he flame throws a stormtrooper and burns <laughs> him alive and yeah they zoom in on the body when it hits the floor yeah and the armor is all like burned and, and you know on the inside of that armor there's a husk of a of a guy I, thought, I, just, I don't know. It just was so dark. Yeah, yeah. What kind of guy though? We don't know. Is he leftover stormtrooper? Is he is he a, a clone kind of person again? Yeah, or? and clones don't matter, right? So. Well, although, although at that at that point there were you know many stormtroopers that were not clones, right? Of a Mandalorian. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Wasn't it? Was it Boba Fett that was the clone? Jango Fett was the oh Jango clone. Fett and then Boba okay. Fett was the like naturally aged clone of Django Fett, that was his like condition. You can you can clone me, but I want one of them to naturally age so I can like raise it as though it's a son. Got it. Okay, and that's Boba Fett. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so Mandalorian uh, busts his way through all these stormtroopers, makes his way to the doctor, and he finds Baby Yoda in a machine. There's some kind of scanning happening. He asks the doctor, "What did you do to it?" And the doctor says, "I protected him." He'd be dead if not for me. In fact, the doctor thinks that the Mandalorian's there to hurt Baby Yoda. He says, please don't hurt him. It's just a child. So he seems to be... It's hard to tell where he stands in all this because he seems to be pretty protective of Baby Yoda, but he's clearly allied himself with some pretty uh, dark characters. They can't tell if he's kind of in over his head or something. Mandalorian takes Baby Yoda, shoots his way out. At one point gets surrounded by a bunch of stormtroopers and that's when the whistling birds come into play they uh basically a bunch of mini rockets fly out kill all the stormtroopers which felt very iron man to me i mean it's identical (laughs) to that exact sequence in iron man one where you're like how is he gonna get out of this and then very easily is the answer because he has that, like, I mean, I guess in Iron Man, I think that comes out of his shoulder, maybe. I think so, yeah. His, yeah, but it's it's the same, very similar concept of vastly outnumbered. Mm-hmm. But I guess at least in this, I don't think in Iron Man they had set up that he had that specific subset of right. technology and there's how it works. It was just kind of, he has a crazy suit that can do a lot of stuff that will see as it goes but not that we knew specifically what whistling birds did but Mm. you know he does it and then you see the oh that was the whistling birds yeah (laughs) that's how that's how i reacted when i watched it just whispered to myself yeah oh it was whistling birds right nice 
so I mean, that was uh, a few examples in the show of. Uh, I mean, we've made fun of it a little bit. The heavy foreshadowing of uh, Mandalorians never come above ground. The whistling birds. Uh, to me, even seeing Baby Yoda's pod in a dumpster right outside uh, the hideout, it all, it all kind of feels unsubtle. Yeah. Is it? Does it bother you at all while you watch the show, or is it just kind of part of the package? No, I mean, I, I, I'm not. I'm not like disappointed by it or anything. Because I mean, it, it's Star Wars. It's not. There's mm-hmm. no. You know, in spite of Empire Strikes Back having one of the most iconic, you know, twists of all time, it's not like a. I don't think you're supposed to be able to have seen it coming if you Mm -hmm. go back and piece together the clues and watch all the you know 96 easter egg youtube videos or or whatever that's not that's not kind of the the point of star wars so i'm 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 okay with it you know if it if it was if it was something different if it was like a watchman or a westworld or something like Mm -hmm. that then maybe i would be like ah this is too i'm not getting out of this what i want out of this but i want like awesome action in a in a really giant world and and cool characters and uh, and it's delivering on all those fronts. Yeah, no, so. agreed. I'm glad you feel that way, so we don't have to shut the podcast down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he grabs Baby Yoda, leaves the hideout, and then, like we alluded to earlier, everyone in town, all their fobs start going off because Baby Yoda is back on the market. And do you think... <laughs> 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 that's the slug. That's the uh, tagline for this episode. <laughs> now, if there was a if this if there was a trailer for this, like, ooh, baby Yoda's back on the market. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. Uh, so, do you think someone hit like an SOS button? But how, how did the what was the it signal happened that, very quickly? I don't yeah. know. It would have had to have been like the doctor, I guess, or unless uh, you know. The client uh, was somehow was yeah. nearby in a where, position. Where to be is able Werner to, Herzog and all this? I don't know. I kept thinking anytime they revealed like the next set of stormtrooper guys there, I thought he was going to be one of them. Especially at the end when the doors open up, and you're like oh, here he's going to be. But no, he was right. You know, I guess he. I, it was also unclear if he got what he needed or not. Mm-hmm. Like, did they get the payoff of that uh, heat vision predator scene where he says, "Just get what we need." Right, so extract the material. Yeah, Did get they that extract then, the material? And then left, and yeah, you know, yeah, unclear. I'm sure we'll see Werner Herzog again, but could have uh, been a tooth too. A tooth, yeah, a tooth. That was the extract. they were trying to extract the tooth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my my theories went from the midichlorians uh, or something in his blood. Right. The other theory was cloning, maybe. Mm. But I feel like if you wanted to clone. The, uh, somebody you wouldn't say extract the material you'd say like extract the DNA right stem cells right grab his stem cells <laughs> <laughs> uh, my other theory was maybe there's something that was placed inside baby Yoda like a data oh, chip or something that's interesting right the galaxy is in Orion's belt <laughs> from the first men in black where it's right. on it's on the cat's thing the whole time it's not the cat it was the his little pendant. Yeah, that's right. Do you remember when you were you were outside my house and you like whispered to somebody? You're like, you know what that movie? What movie that's from? Uh, it's on Orion's belt. And you didn't know I could hear you. And I was like, Men in Black. <laughs> I don't remember that, but that that sounds right. I like Men in Black. Yeah. yeah did you see um, uh, International? No, I did not. Yeah, I heard it was. Uh, I heard it wasn't very good. Mm. Yeah, it didn't look great. <laughs> so everyone's fobs go off. The Mandalorian just walks through town, even though people are coming out of the woodwork. They're coming out of their various bars, buildings, or whatever. And he just keeps walking. But then uh, Grief Karga stops him before he can reach his ship. And he tells him to put the baby in the speeder. The Mandalorian walks over to the speeder. And instead of putting the baby in, he jumps in, tells the droid to drive. The droid doesn't listen. He pulls his gun out and he yeah. says... <laughs> Does that make sense? Do droids I mean, have guess. self-preservation? I of like, guess. He's got a gun. I better do what he says. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. I don't know. I, I just thought it was funny. I believed it. I'm fine with it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have changed anything about it, but it's funny. And again, droid dynamic. Mando and, and droids. Yeah, he does not care for droids. Definitely not. He, I bet if he met BB-8, it would change things for him. Yeah. BB-8's the baby Yoda of droids. Exactly. So he jumps into the speeder. The droid listens to him after the gun's pulled on him, and they drive off. 
as they're driving, he's blasting away at people. Eventually, Grief is able to take the speeder out. He starts to get surrounded, and he pulls out every trick he has. He blasts people. He uses his flamethrower until it runs out of, I guess, fuel. There's a kind of cool shot where he shakes his hand after the fuel runs out. <laughs> uh, and then he, again, kind of gets saved at the last minute where he looks down at Baby Yoda I kind of read that scene as, sorry, kid, I did the best I could. Right. And then all the Mandalorians. And by the way, Jeremy, you know, Mandalorians never leave their never, hideout. Never. One at a time. But this is, uh, they all showed up. One at a time. That's right. And uh, they saved him, including the heavy infantry guy who, uh, who tells him to, uh, you know, drive off. We'll hold them off. The Mandalorian says, you're going to have to relocate the covert. And heavy infantry guy says, this is the way. The Mandalorian says, this is the way. So um, overall, I thought that was a cool scene. As cheesy as it was that they, they kept so heavily setting up how rare it is to see Mandalorians, it still it worked for me. It was, it was again, I mean, this episode overall, I think, had the best action we've seen between this scene and the earlier one uh, for you scene work yeah scene scene definitely worked it it was fine again it's one of those things i think where if you i didn't necessarily predict specifically that that was going to happen but if i probably was thinking about it really closely and was like oh what possibly could save him here you know maybe you put it together but it was it was cool the action was great it it worked off the this is the way was a Mm -hmm. cool payoff i kind of wish we had heard it in episode one right also so it wasn't like it feels unnecessarily forced into just this episode when mm-hmm. we had like he interacted with the armorer before i guess he didn't talk to other mandalorians so maybe that's why mm-hmm. but like i wish it had a cooler uh thing but it was still it's awesome yeah. they, they come in they all save the day it's a, the, if if there was a part of it that was over the top cheesy i think it's that as he when he's going away and that guy like Iron Man's next to him. <laughs> Salutes him. Yeah. And then he <laughs> says to himself, or I guess to Baby Yoda too, like, I gotta get me one of those, or something like that, which again was like really, I was like, what is this? What is this? It tone? was the, it's, so that's what that feels like <laughs> moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was just very strange, uh, but but cool. The, act, the action sequence by itself was awesome, and I definitely don't mind the, you know, Mandalorians coming. I guess other than that, they're supposed to all be ruthless warriors mm-hmm. who only care about themselves. And if we're seeing one guy flip, I believe it. Maybe it's weirder to watch a whole uh, sect of their tribe of them. Uh, right. The entire covert. Be willing to. Yeah. I, they basically all break their code by helping him break the code. Yeah. Kind of. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean the action was awesome. The the, the scene was great. Uh, yeah, yeah, I enjoyed. And it. the uh, the point you brought up about kind of wishing they'd set up the line "This is the way" earlier. It's sort of it, it, the show feels weirdly episodic, like they're not acknowledging the fact that people are going to watch this in a serialized way, and you can set stuff up in earlier episodes. It feels like they have the setup and the payoff all within one episode every time. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that they're trying to strike a middle ground between having the serialized story, but still being able to come into one single episode and get a kind of complete arc. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Yeah. So Mandalorian, he's safe, right? He got away, goes back to his ship. But wait a minute. Grief Karga is on the ship waiting for him. And he holds him up at gunpoint, but as always, Mandalorian's got a trick up his sleeve. What if he had said, I'd like to file a grievance? And like that was how he revealed that he was there. That was his entry line. So I think, yeah, I wish you, if you were on the writing staff for this show, you'd have been like, I've got two ideas. Number one, if you could set up the, uh, uh, what's the line? The, uh, this is the way. This is the way, yeah. Like, oh, that's a great idea. And you're like, I've got another, if you like that one, I have a grievance. Like, <laughs> I mean, he says, gotta get me one of those. It's basically, yeah, it's and true. What's, where's the line? There's also a, a kind of funny scene where, where the Mandalorian, once all the Mandalorians show up, you can see there's all this chaos. And there is a quick shot of, uh, of grief kind of looking around, and you can tell he has the idea to go sneak on the ship. <laughs> it, looked, it looked pretty funny if you rewatch it. 
Uh, so Mandalorian shoots his grappling hook out at some piece of the ship, which releases a bunch of steam. And in the chaos, he's able to shoot Grief Karga, knocking him out of the ship. But Grief had some Mandalorian steel in his pocket, which saves him. I think, though, Mandalorian was shooting to he kill, did. right? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a very specific shot. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we're maybe supposed... I don't know how he would... I guess when he showed him that he had that, did he show him that it was in that pocket? He did. He did. That's right. He he lifted his shirt and kind of showed he had the steel there. So Mandalorian would have known exactly where to shoot him. Yeah, man. Again, his that moral gray area with him. He yeah. breaks the code. He shoots the guy. But wait, he knew he had it there the whole time. But I, I, why, though? He killed so many people this episode. Yeah, this was his guy. Yeah, that's true. They've worked together a lot. Yeah. Yeah, okay. He just he also just paid him like a ton of money. Even if he was he's got a, you know, he just did him a big favor kind of. He yeah. doesn't get that job if not for grief. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I wonder if if grief will one day take on a uh, sort of alliance role with him. Is right now it seems like they obviously work together. Right. But uh I have to imagine that he created an enemy here by shooting him, unless Grief recognizes. I would think so. <laughs> unless Grief recognizes that he spared his life. Shooting him, destroying the town. Yeah. Uh, maybe that was Grief Speeder. If he had a Griefence before. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so Mandalorian flies off, and as you mentioned earlier, the big Mandalorian right. flies War next machine to him. flies next to him. <laughs> War yeah. machine. Salutes him, and he says, I got to get me one of those. So <laughs> weird. Like, I, I, Star Wars is very corny. I don't. I'm not trying to say that it is this very sophisticated, but it just was. I don't know. It felt like something like, uh, you know, child Anakin, Jake Lloyd would have would have said, like mm-hmm. some kind of a now this is pod racing style line for a character who, even though those lines are not uncharacteristic of Star Wars, mm-hmm. like it just didn't feel like it felt like it fit. You know, the Mandalorian necessary i mean there's precedent for a han solo had a very similar line in force awakens after he tries out chewbacca's uh what's it called the um bowcaster yeah is that what it's called the gun thing yeah yeah the bowcaster bowcaster and then afterwards he shoots it and he's like i like that (laughs) (laughs) that's fine i think that's okay yeah and at least he was saying it to chewbacca but arguably mandalorian was saying it to baby yoda Maybe. Because, and maybe he right after, because the episode ends, so maybe right after he said, eh, that was a whiff. You yeah. <laughs> like, eh, I missed. The the, the cold or, or warm line was pretty good. That was a good one. I like those odds. Pretty good one. Gotta yeah. get me one of those. <laughs> Cross the line. This is when he's flying in the ship by himself. That's when he practices all his one-liners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what? I would. Well, right? yeah, that's very realistic. Yeah, that is very. Never mind. I like it. All right, cool. <laughs> Glad I was able to make a convincing case. Yeah, he turns case. to Baby Yoda right after and says, don't tell anyone I said that. It yeah. didn't work. This stays between us, kid. You owe me. Yeah. And then he says, I haven't been training a partner. I've been training a replacement. That's from the end of Men in Black. Oh, <laughs> oh and I should say that Baby Yoda is reaching for that little ball again. Yeah. And uh, Mando drops it to him. Yeah. Very cool cute. moment. Cool moment. So, yeah, overall, like we said, really solid episode. Uh, I love how much it leans into the Western vibe. I know I keep bringing that up, but him walking through town, getting stopped on his way out, like, hold it right there. Yeah. Love it. And uh, can't wait to see the the kind of lone wolf adventure he's going on now with Baby Though, How is he going to travel with Baby Yoda? He doesn't have that pod anymore. Think about I, that. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. He'll have to make some kind of Baby Bjorn, I guess. Yeah. What well, is that the thing that you... Um, that's like it straps to your chest and the oh, baby's like yeah. attached to you. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, and also, um, yeah, so really solid episode. Can't wait to see where it goes next. Uh, and by the way, this episode was directed by Deborah Chow, who was, I believe, the first female to direct any live-action Star Wars. And not only that, she was just recently tapped to direct Obi-Wan, Yeah, the uh, series that's coming to Disney+. Plus. I would say this made me feel, not that I wasn't gonna feel good about that and watch that and uh you know do a podcast about that too mm-hmm. but uh but this this was a good uh definitely vote of confidence for me yeah 
Definitely. And, oh, that reminds me, actually, uh, one of the fan theories I heard, who saved uh, the little kid Mandalorian? Yeah. Uh, Obi-Wan. Does that make sense? I... Does wait, it... no, hold on. Obi-Wan would be dead by then. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no. This That would be before... It would be weird. I think the timeline might work. Anakin, I think, was a kid. Um, no, I have no idea. We have to research this. Yeah, I got to figure out... Because how... Do we know how old the Mandalorian is? Mm, no, I was going to say 50, but I was thinking of Baby, Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda, yeah. yeah. Wow, what a twit. Baby Yoda, older than the Mandalorian. I mean, presumably he is. Yeah. yeah. It's still funny. I guess we always knew that. But. Yeah. <laughs> it's dumb. That was a dumb point. <laughs> this is like, that That was Jeremy's, I got to get me one of those moments. <laughs> yeah, I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy. Gil. It is weeks, mere weeks left until the the conclusion of the Skywalker saga, a story you've been following since you were even younger than Baby Yoda. True. Way younger than Baby Yoda. Way younger. I am still am. So how, yeah, true. How hyped are you for this movie? I would say that I am extremely hyped for this movie. As, as I have been, I'll give the disclaimer, for every Star Wars release of, mm -hmm. of my life. Uh... I'm very excited. I keep listening to the music from the trailer, which is which is a weird, doesn't really sound like a John Williams type thing necessarily because it's this like slowed down melodramatic version of the Star Wars theme. Um, but it is still uh, it is still very awesome, and I, mm -hmm. I I'm excited. I didn't watch. They like released some snippet of a scene uh, mm -hmm. today uh, online or at some point yeah. online. Um, that I have now, like, I'm, I think I'm cutting myself this off. Is your like, I don't want to watch any new. I only barely wanted to watch the trailer. I'm glad I did. It made me very excited. But I kind of, like, I didn't need it. I'm going to be there opening night anyway. I don't need yeah. to. Do you have you know. your tickets? I do. Yep. Nice. As I was going to say, I got, I bought five. I got really excited and just bought five tickets. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I'm going, I will be there uh, d December 19th at, uh, you know, nine o'clock or whatever. Awesome. Is. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, right afterwards... Run back to my apartment. That's it. We'll do the uh, Star Wars uh, immediate reaction. Immediate reaction. Because <laughs> I wanted to get you on mic saying that, so you can't back out. Yeah, I'm on yeah. mic. <laughs> I'm on mic. No, I'm going to be excited, and I'm probably going to be immediately like very excited about it right after, too, and then yeah. I'll think about it more and probably ultimately remain excited because I, you know, Star Wars is something that I want to like. So yeah, exactly. I try to like it. Yeah, and I, I've got to think that they are... Being very careful. I shouldn't to make say I sure. try to like it. That makes it sound like I'm a really big apologist. I don't try to do or do not. Uh, oh gosh, there is no try, no, Jeremy. True. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but I mean, I like it. I'm very excited. The trailer is awesome. The scenes look good. What is three PO doing? Why is he saying goodbye? Yeah. Uh, will I cry in the theater? It's heartbreaking Likely. that scene. When I saw the Last Jedi, right when the uh, when the opening hit, mm -hmm. someone in the middle of the theater in the dark raised a lightsaber above his head and just went like, ah! and the whole theater went crazy. Um, so maybe that'll happen again. Mm -hmm. I, there's a lot of stuff. I'm 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 excited. New new creatures, new droids, probably. Are you? What's Palpatine your opinion? That's what I was going to say. I want to get your take on that because I know that was controversial. Palpatine coming back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's so many different contexts that he could come back or not. I mean, Yoda was in the last movie, like mm -hmm. I, Palpatine. Yes, there's the shot in the trailer that makes it look like he is in some kind of a mech. Like, he looks very tall. But yeah, I, a I don't wild, know, that, Wild West-style giant spider. Uh, yeah, oh, wow. That's what it, <laughs> that's, you know what? That, that I would dislike, I guess. That right. would maybe be the only possible thing, is if there's a... Uh, Whatever that ah, uh, uh, why can't I think of his? Why can't I think of the villain's name from? Oh, from Wild Wild West. Yeah, oh, I'm not gonna remember that. No, whatever. If that if if Palpatine is in a mech spider uh, suit, although it wouldn't be the first time that Star Wars has brought back a seemingly deceased villain with a uh, mech spider, with mech spider uh, paraphernalia. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I, there's so many different things that they could do. Like, how could I possibly hate it in right. advance? Everybody loves Palpatine. As corny as everything in the prequels are, he seems to be immune mm -hmm. to that with the, the unlimited power and all that <laughs> stuff. Like, he's going to have some awesome lines. To, you know, he's great. I'm excited. Yeah, and I, 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 yeah, I was nothing but happy when I heard that. Because I, 
want this to... I mean, they're trying to strike the balance of wrap up this current trilogy and also somehow bring closure to the last nine movies. And I want them to bring something back and somehow close the loop. And it, yeah, if they don't do it in a clever way and it feels shoehorned in, I'm not going to like it. But we have no reason to think that yet. In fact, I thought J.J. Abrams did a solid job with Force Awakens. Yeah. So I, I have some trust in him. Yeah, I'm definitely excited. What if Palpatine comes out in a mech suit and then Luke right, turn, comes back and says, I got to get me one of those <laughs> at like the halfway point in the movie. And then the end duel is Luke versus Palpatine, both in like mecha, <laughs> Godzilla, Megazord form. I think we got to end there. Yeah, I, lo- I love it. that idea. That's it. Rise of Skywalker. Spo- spoiler alert. Mecha battle. Well, thanks for listening to today's episode of the One Take Podcast. If you enjoyed this, make sure to log into your Apple Podcast app, leave a rating, leave a review. If you listen to this podcast, you're automatically an awesome person. But if you go that extra step, leave a rating, you become a slightly even more awesome person, if that's even possible. And make sure to go to youtube.com slash one take vids. Link in the show notes to see the One Take YouTube channel where we're doing recaps of Watchmen, reviews of movies like The Irishman or Terminator Dark Fate. And if you're looking for even more entertainment, if that's not enough, go to surecast.com and see the network where we've got other podcasts and other things to entertain you. Thanks for listening. Did you hear what the uh, Mandalorian said when he met uh, Little Miss Muffet? No. This is the way. (laughs) That's why you listen to this. (laughs) 